So that gets us into figuring out what is a quantum dot and what can we do with it in terms of heterostructures and quantum dots. So one way to describe what quantum dots are, are it's a well-conducting or low-energy domain surrounded in, thro in all three dimensions by a, a sort of a low-conducting slash high-energy region. And the domain size needs to be a roughly of the order of nanometers, which is the, roughly the wavelength of electrons. And there's a second part is that the, uh, you need to look at the electronic structure where the electron energy may be quantized. You end up with an artificial atom, and if you have coupled quantum dots, you might have an artificial molecule. And it contains a countable number of electrons, not an infinite number. So here's one sort of stick diagram example of a sort of a confinement potential. So the, here's a lower energy material, and it's buffered by a higher energy material. This is a conduction bandage, say, of indium arsenide versus gallium arsenide. And that's what I sort of mean by uh, high, well-conducting, low-conducting, high energy, low energy is sort of a rather general term. You can string these things together, uh, where you might have multiple quantum dots, so this is a one-dimensional picture. And why would you care? Because in this artificial atom, you can tune these eigenenergies of this photon absorption spectrum. So you can build detectors in a sense, which could serve as an input, right? You have light coming in, you sense it, that's an input. But you can also have an uh, electron fall down in energy and emit a photon. That's a laser. That's an output. It's an optical output. And you can have crazy stuff like tunneling from one state to the next through a barrier. And if you do that, you can have electron transport and you occupy these states, and that gives you logic and memory. To have input, output, and logic and memory on the same quantum structure is sort of like the ultimate pipe dream of a device person, right? We don't have that today where all of these components are really on the same chip, in the same material, in the same arrangement. But in a sense, that is the ultimate pipe dream. All right, so here's some images of quantum dots of an s orbital and p orbitals and a pyramidal dot to give you an idea. And so quantum dots or heterostructures are artificial atoms that can be custom designed for a variety of applications. So let me talk a little bit about a resonant tunneling diode. Uh, it's a double barrier structure, uh, typically in one dimension. So you have a material variation in one dimension. So here is maybe gallium arsenide, aluminum arsenide, gallium arsenide, aluminum arsenide, and gallium arsenide on the bottom left. And as you increase the voltage, you pull the emitter, uh, sorry, the collector on the right-hand side a little bit down, and as you pull down the uh, collector, you also pull down the resonance, and now you have electrons flow through uh, the structure. So you can have transmission through here. Now if you increase the bias further, what you have is uh, no supply of electrons right here. So there's, there's no electrons that can go through and the current goes down. Now if you apply a bias further, you have now carrier flow through the second resonance or over this emitter uh, collector barrier here and the current goes back up. And you end up with this characteristic N-shaped curve. So why would you care? Well. It's kind of odd, you increase the voltage and current goes down. Right? That's very much not like Ohm's law. Right? Ohm's law is sort of here, right? Voltage goes up, current goes up. That's what we're used to. Well, if you're having something like this in this downslope, that's a so-called negative differential conductance or negative differential resistance. It does the opposite of what a normal resistor does. So there's two things you can do with that. One, you can, put that, you can put that into a feedback loop. If you put this device into a feedback loop, that device goes bananas. It likes to oscillate. It's an oscillator. It's a natural oscillator circuit. And the cool thing is it oscillates at the frequency of as high as this thing can go, which is the tunneling time through these barriers, which means terahertz. Forget gigahertz, right? Terahertz. That's pretty fast. The other thing is, if you can build a circuit that likes to latch onto this low part on the bottom here, 
you could have imagine a, a one and a zero or a zero and a one in a latch circuit. And so you can think about building logic out of these type of devices. Okay? So that's where a lot of this excitement for resonant tunneling diodes came from in, in the 70s and 80s. So what I'm showing you on the right is, as opposed to the uh, experimental data and uh, a, a NEMO simulation in black, uh, that's a real device. Uh, in fact, there's 12 different IV curves from two different wafers, from three different MESA sizes and two bias directions. That's all these green dots here. And the black line is prediction before experiment. Okay? Now that's, what, on the left you have Mickey Mouse diagrams of concepts. On the right you have real device simulation. <coughs> uh, in 1994, when the NEMO program sort of started the development of it, the peak to value ratio, the best thing you could get was about 80. 86, I think, was the world record. Um, and, but to make this viable, it ought to be 1,000. Right? The on-off ratio for a digital circuit should be 1,000. Otherwise, you have a very good space heater. That thing just gets too hot. Which really meant we need to understand where this valley current comes from here. Why is this thing not turning off? What's the physics of this valley current? So by 1997, we were able to basically overlap experiment and theory. And what I'll be talking in this course in, in, in big chunks is, where is this valley current coming from? What's the theory behind it? How do you model these devices? And how do you get away from stick diagrams on the left to real device simulation on the right. So here's some uh, example implementation of quantum dots, which are in a sense also RTDs, but in three-dimensional confinement. So here's some indium gallium arsenide dots and, quantum and gallium arsenide. They're grown as self-assembled dots. Here are some quantum dots as di uh, uh, gated uh, structures. Here are some colloidal quantum dots, and you might have seen these fancy images of cadmium selenide dots that, depending on their size, emit light at different frequencies. Um, there are some applications of thinking about single electron memory, um, having single electron transistors, or even uh, uh, logic based on quantum cellular automata. Then for quantum dots might be used for, for medical markers, for quantum computings to shuttle qubits around, or for optical detectors. And the interesting piece here is that quantum dots, normal quantum wells are blind to orthogonal uh, light. So light that comes in from the top, you actually have to turn the light around to make it be absorbed in a quantum well. But quantum dots, since they have a three-dimensional topology, can absorb light. Uh, even from the uh, straight angle, which is about what this slide is. So here, quantum wells are blind to light impinging orthogonal. You kind of have to turn it around. And what people do is they build all kinds of electromagnetic couplers that actually turn the light around, which reduces overall the efficiency of the coupling overall, but it makes the light even absorbable. Quantum dots, due to their uh, three-dimensional nature, really allow uh, to absorb light even from the orthogonal angle. You don't have to turn it around. 